All right, well, good evening and welcome. I want to be uh, probably one of the last to welcome you to Las Vegas, welcome you to ASHP, and obviously welcome to our exceptional program that we have for you tonight. Obviously, you can see the title, and this is uh, an issue that every single one of you probably deals with here in your clinical practice on a daily basis, and that is the obvious patient with diabetes. Well, we're going to change gears a little bit tonight. We're going to talk about optimizing cardiovascular outcomes in type 2 diabetes, obviously going beyond those A1C goals to improve the cardiovascular well-being of our patients. Uh, I will be serving as your moderator tonight. It's an absolute honor for me. My name is Randy Fugit. I'm an internal medicine infectious disease specialist, as well as director of antimicrobial stewardship at the Denver VA, or what is now known as the Rocky Mountain Regional Medical Center. I'm also a clinical associate professor at the Skagg School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Colorado on the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado. But it is my absolute honor to be introducing our speaker tonight, who uh, really needs no introduction. Most of you are well aware of her accomplishments. Significantly published, significantly teaching in a variety of different arenas. I'm truly honored to be with Susan, Dr. Susan Cornell, Associate Director, Office of Experiential Education, as well as Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice at Midwestern University, Chicago College of Pharmacy in Downers Grove, Illinois. She is also a Certified Diabetes Care and Educational Specialist at the Bolingbrook Christian Health Clinic in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Dr. Cornell received her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy. She then went on to complete her doctorate in pharmacy at Midwestern University College of Pharmacy. As I said, she is a certified diabetes educator. She's a fellow of the American Pharmacists Association, a fellow of the American Association of Diabetes Educators, and most of you are well aware of her significant contributions to the diabetic literature, both in text and peer-reviewed journals. So for tonight, uh, our disclosures are here in front of you. And a little bit of our program information before we get started. This program is approved for 1.5 continuing pharmacy education credit. And one of the big things I want to make sure that I impose upon you is that before you leave, please ensure that you've completed your evaluation form and turn it into the NACME representative on your way out the door. Uh, you will receive your credit in the mail for this session, and it will be e emailed to you, oh, excuse me, by email within four to six weeks. Uh, the faculty will leave the last 15 minutes where we will go over any of the questions that you might have. And I also want to welcome all of our individuals for the simulcast, the few hundred that are also attending this program tonight via that source. Uh, this program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, uh, the complete source for your healthcare associated medical education needs. And the program is supported by a very generous educational grant from Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals. Lilly USA, and Novo Nordisk. And I cannot thank them enough for putting this together for us. So the learning objectives for tonight is first of all, obviously we're gonna summarize the management of cardiovascular risk in our patients with type two diabetes. As you know, this is a very significant disease state and as I mentioned earlier, there's not a day that goes by that you don't encounter a patient with this disease state. We're going to integrate data from the type 2 diabetes cardiovascular outcome trials into clinical practice to implement individualized management strategies for patients with type 2 diabetes at high risk and or with a history of cardiovascular disease. And finally, develop plan-wide management strategies that facilitate coordinated quality cardiovascular disease management in patients with type 2 diabetes across all types of practice settings. So without further ado, at each of your tables, you have a clicker. Um, suggest you get that right now. We're gonna go through a little pre-activity survey, and then we'll revisit these questions at the end and see how uh, you basically did, and hopefully uh, some learning occurred while we're here tonight. 
So Mrs. S is a 65-year-old lady. She has type 2 diabetes. She's been taking metformin for two years. Her A1C is currently 7.9%, and her estimated glomerular filtration rate is 90. And she was recently diagnosed with heart failure. Which therapy would be the best addition to her regimen? Albaglutide? Empagliflozin, saxagliptin, or citagliptin? Please enter your answers now. All right, question number two. For which of the GLP-1 receptor agonists is, there a, is the strongest evidence for cardiovascular disease benefit in patients with type 2 diabetes and established ASCVD? Lysixanide, long-acting exenonide, semaglutide, or liraglutide? Please enter your answer. All right, pre-activity question three. I think we've got a novel up here. Uh, for patients without established ASCVD or CKD whose hemoglobin A1C levels are above target following first-line therapy and for whom there is a compelling need to minimize weight gain, promote weight loss, the American Diabetes Standards in Medical Care of Diabetes 2019 suggests one option for treatment that is a GLP-1A receptor antagonist, agonist, excuse me, and with good efficacy for weight loss. What is the correct order of these medications in terms of efficacy? And rather than uh, presenting all of these, I'm gonna allow you to read them and uh, put them in order yourselves. Okay, question number four. Which clinical trial's primary outcome was renal with cardiovascular secondary? Was it the LEADER trial, Credence trial, Saver Timmy, or Pioneer 6? Okay, now please rate your confidence in optimally treating patients with type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular comorbidities. Do you feel very confident? Confident? Somewhat confident, slightly confident, or not at all confident? Please vote. Hopefully they're all at the top. What's that? Yeah. All right, now please rate your familiarity with cardiovascular outcome trials for medications for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Again, very familiar, familiar, somewhat familiar, slightly familiar or you don't have a clue. Okay, well with that I appreciate you answering all the questions and uh, before I bring Dr. Cornell up here, I just want you to know how, what an incredible educator you're about to hear. Hopefully this will be one of the most important meetings that you've attended here at ASHP. I've had the distinct honor of working with Dr. Cornell for over a decade. Probably, well, we're not that old, but uh, we've had the honor of probably speaking in every major city in this country. So I really, it is a true honor to be able to introduce my friend, my colleague, Dr. Susan Cornell. Well, thank you, Dr. Fugit. Well, welcome. Everything he just said just means I'm the old person in the room. That's all that means. All right, so now, Randy, when you first told me about this, I thought we were going to the rodeo. That's what I thought, too. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, well, let's wrap this up and get to the rodeo. Uh, well, welcome, and thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for spending your evening with us. It's always an honor for me to give a diabetes talk over or right after dinner. It was most appropriate, and I hope the dessert was great. 
So with that being said, let me start out with the take home message. So I want to tell you now before your postprandial glucose spike kicks in and everyone falls asleep. So bottom line, the take home message is there is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. Okay, so I'm gonna say that again because it's really important. There is no such thing as a person with just diabetes. Diabetes is one disease state that goes hand in hand with many others, particularly cardiovascular disease, as well as renal. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Because when we're looking at our patients that have diabetes, we have to think beyond glycemic control. Managing their sugar is very important, but it is only one component of everything we have to look at in these people. Because really, if you think about it, what is gonna kill them? It's gonna be the cardiovascular disease. And that's gonna come from not only uncontrolled sugar, but kidney disease, et cetera. So it's very important to realize we have to look beyond glycemic measures. You know, the slides here, they're for your sleeping pleasure. What I would rather do is spend our time together talking about important points. So if we think about it, as I've already said, we want to think beyond glycemic control. And first of all, we have to realize that in the United States, despite the fact that we have 12 classes of drugs to treat type 2 diabetes, we are still not meeting goal. There are still people, 50% or more in some cases of populations, that have an A1C greater than 7. So bottom line, we are not getting to the people to lower their blood glucose. And the scary part is people with diagnosed diabetes, we're following them. There's actually three times more people with pre-diabetes than there are with diabetes. So if we don't get this under control, we're going to have a major epidemic going on within this country as well as around the world. So bottom line is, by the time a person is actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they've had the disease for about nine years. Again, type 2 diabetes, it takes approximately 9 to 12 years to diagnose. And if you think about it, a person doesn't wake up one day and say, you know, gosh, I don't feel right today. Something's wrong. I think I have diabetes. That's not what happens. What happens is they wake up one day and they say, gosh, my vision's blurry. I better go in and see the doctor. Or I have this wound on my foot that is just not healing. I, th I think I should look at it. I've had this urinary tract infection for God, you know, who knows how long. I have gum disease. I can't hear. I better go see a doctor. Or even worse, I'm having a heart attack or a stroke. And these are the things, the complications that bring the patient in, either to the ambulatory care clinic or into the hospital. And it's like, oh yes, you're having a heart attack, but did you know you have diabetes? And that's the problem, because by the time a person is diagnosed, they already have complications. And this is primarily with type 2. And if we look at it, they have not only the microvascular complications, but they have the macrovascular complications. If we look at the history of diabetes, of type 2 diabetes, the postprandial glucose is the first thing that goes up. So those of you that have diabetes, be it diagnosed or undiagnosed or pre-diabetes, your postprandial is going up, but your fasting is normal. So if you think about that, your postprandial goes up first. The last thing that goes up is the fasting. And that's the reason why it takes so long to diagnose, because typically we look at fasting. If we look at postprandial, we can diagnose diabetes a whole lot sooner. But then looking at that, the postprandial glucose is directly linked to the food you eat. And the food we eat is directly linked to cardiovascular disease. So the postprandial glucose is all about the food, and it's all about macrovascular complications. By the time the fasting goes up, the fasting is directly linked to microvascular complications. So it's important to realize postprandial, macrovascular, and that's what happens first, and that's the reason why oftentimes, oftentimes we see cardiovascular damage 
before the glucose is even going up. And this is where we see metabolic syndrome. Now, I want to take one minute here to say that everything I've just talked about is the history of type 2. However, as I started out when I said there's no such thing as a person with just diabetes, they have cardiovascular disease, you're thinking, well, what about type 1? Because many type 1 people, do they just have diabetes? And in the answer is possibly, but in type 1, we're starting to see an increase in insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome because our type 1 people are overweight or obese. Obesity is not restricted to type 2. There are many people with type 1 that are also overweight and obese. So all of this has to do with insulin resistance. And that insulin resistance is what leads to the cardiovascular damage. And that's what we're going to be talking about through the, through the day, evening tonight. I was going to say through the day. We'd be here for a while. Through the evening. So one of the things we have to look at, too, in type 2 diabetes, because of the fact it takes so long to diagnose, the beta cell function starts to decline. And it's actually noted from a lot of the work that Dr. DeFranzo has done, and I speak highly of Dr. DeFranzo. Uh, Dr. Ralph DeFranzo is out of uh, the Texas Diabetes Institute. I call him the godfather of diabetes. He's Italian, so he appreciates it. Uh, so bottom line is he's done a lot of work, and he's actually done uh, research to show that even at impaired glucose tolerance, 65% of the beta cell function is already lost. So by the time you reach full-blown diabetes, you actually have lost about 80% of the beta cell function. And this is the reason why we need to start looking again beyond glycemic control, because beta cell function Decline in that means we have an increase often in hyperglucagonemia. That's a different lecture for a different time, but all of this related leads to insulin resistance. Now, I want to share a little tip that we do with our patients often. You know, we ask our patients, I'm at a free clinic, um, we've been at the Bolingbrook Clinic, you know, we see anything and everything. And, you know, many times we ask our patients to do finger sticks, finger sticks check your sugar. You have diabetes, check your sugar. Well, what should the patient look for? And why is that important to the patient? So one of the tools or tips I give with patients is when they're checking their sugar first thing in the morning, the fasting sugar, and that number is above whatever the goal is we have for them, because we do individualize our goals. So when the fasting is above goal, that's telling them when they're going to have eye problems, feet problems, kidney problems, because remember, the fasting is directly linked to microvascular disease. When they check their sugar two hours after a meal, and the sugar is above whatever their target goal is, in this case, that's telling when their heart attack or their stroke is coming. So this is the importance of looking not only at fasting, but at postprandial. And you know, oftentimes, we'll start to move forward with what we talk about glucose variability and looking at continuous glucose monitors. That's a different topic for a different time, but the importance of knowing what your sugar is helps us to better control not only the glycemic value, but again, the variability in sugar in, in fluctuation, which is damaging to the cardiovascular tissue. So again, Dr. DeFranzo um, has infamously named the omnius octet the eight defects in type 2 diabetes. So here you can see there are eight broken organs, as I like to call them, eight broken organs. And take home message for you, remember I said 12 classes of drugs to treat type 2 diabetes? Not one, not one of those classes fixes all eight broken organs, which is the reason why combination therapy in diabetes is so relevant because, again, not one class will fix all eight broken organs. Now, with that being said, lifestyle will help, and I don't want to underestimate that because medication never replaces lifestyle. Medication adds to lifestyle. So by having patients exercise, eat healthier, get a good night's rest, decrease stress, all of this makes a difference in helping managing their blood glucose levels. 
as well as cardiovascular risk factors. So again, we have eight broken organs, the alpha cell in the pancreas, the beta cell, the liver, the peripheral tissue, the muscle, the brain. The, there's no one telling the brain you're full. That's part of the problem. We have the GI tract. We have the kidney. And then my all-time personal favorite, belly fat. Yes, fat is an active organ. Those of you, like myself, that might carry your, your fat up front, this is the bad fat. Anyone sitting on your fat, that's the good fat. So there is bad fat, there is good fat. The bad fat, the belly fat, the reason I want to talk about this is this is what really leads to insulin resistance. The visceral fat, the fat wrapped around your organs, is cardiometabolic. It releases junk into your bloodstream and into your system. It releases tumor necrosis factor, cytokines, interleukins. It decreases adiponectin. And that's all coming from the free fatty acids, oftentimes from large carbohydrate or sugary products. There's a lot more to it, but that's the simplified term. So the belly fat and insulin resistance is what actually leads to a lot of the cardiovascular damage as well as the inflammation. And you're gonna hear, because even though we're talking the omnius octet, there is talk of the egregious 11, so 11 broken organs, and bottom line, the big change has to do with inflammation. So you're gonna to start to hear more and more talk about inflammation, not only from the diabetes factor, but again, the, uh, the cardiovascular. So when we start to look at drug therapy to treat diabetes, we need to know what is this drug doing? Yes, is it safe? That's most important. But is it helping the patient? Is it helping them overall? So we have to look at the risks and the benefits and moving it forward. So what we want to start to look at is, again, beyond glycemia, cardiovascular. So let's think about this for a second. You have a person who has diabetes, type 2 diabetes. They're overweight. They're newly diagnosed. They're told, eat healthy, exercise, quit smoking, take your medication, check your sugar, reduce your stress, and oh, by the way, the medication we're going to give you, it's going to cause you to gain weight. I mean, how stupid is that? You just set your patient up to fail. You know, come on, let's set the patient up to succeed, not to fail. Don't give them a drug that's working against them. Give them something that works with them. And that's what we need to look forward to, or we have to look at. The other big thing is, what is the hypoglycemia risk? Hypoglycemia is a cardiovascular risk factor. Hypoglycemia can cause cardiovascular damage. Because once again, the variability, the fluctuations in glucose, when we are not in range, you're going to hear a term, time in range, how much time in 24-hour period is your glucose within range? How much does it go above or below? And when it goes above and below, those huge fluctuations damage endothelial tissue. It's like throwing a baseball at a wall, and it's going to damage the tissue, which then allows macrophages to get inside, and hence inflammation, atherosclerosis. So that's what ends up happening. So again, we have to look at minimizing hypoglycemia, minimizing weight gain, and again, safety, not only for the kidneys, but for the heart. And of course, cost, which you know is the big 800-pound gorilla in the room. Now, with that being said, um, I'm happy to share with you that the 2019 algorithm for managing diabetes, drug algorithm here, um, is probably only going to be in existence for a few more days. So this slide will be obsolete very shortly. There is a major, major change that is about to take place in the landscape of diabetes medication. Um, so I will share that with you in a few seconds. But bottom line, the way the current algorithm is looking at is, yes, we start metformin first line. If maximum dose of metformin or metformin is not tolerated and you need to then add on to metformin, the choices are based on four categories. 
The first question, so we, we start out with the first question. Does the patient have established ASCVD? Do they have established ASCVD? If the answer is yes, then our choices, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let me, if the answer is yes, our choices are GLP-1 or SGLT-2. And I'm going to go break this down in a second. If the answer is no, they don't have established ASCVD, meaning they haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or some type of cardiovascular event, then you look at, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to have weight loss, or are we focused on the weight, or are we focused on hypoglycemia, or are we focused on cost? So that's what this current guideline is. Now, we talk about metformin at least for the next few days to weeks being first line. So if you haven't already gathered, metformin is no longer going to be the only first line agent. You will have a choice of first line agents coming down the pipeline. I know this because I've actually talked to the authors of the new guidelines. They've shared with me the entire new guidelines. They have not shared me, with me when it's coming out. Um, so bottom line, metformin for right now is still the current first line therapy. However, again, keep in mind that's gonna change shortly. Metformin fixes really one broken organ. It fixes the liver. It has a residual effect on peripheral tissue, and there is talk that it has an effect on the gut microbiome. So I don't want to dismiss metformin. It's a good drug. It's an older drug. But again, it doesn't really fix all those broken organs. To me, the big benefit of metformin is going to be the gut microbiome. You're going to hear a lot about that in the future, and I think that's where we're going to see metformin's place in therapy. But cardiovascular-wise, renal-wise, is metformin really helping this patient? You know, so that's something we have to look at moving forward. Does it have ASCVD benefits? We don't know because metformin came out in 1995. And I know that because I was actually a practicing pharmacist at the time, so again, I am the old person in the room. But bottom line is, is metformin as beneficial for beyond glycemic measures as some of these other medications we're going to talk about today? So again, something to start thinking about. Now, we know benefit of metformin is, of course, not only A1C lowering, and it has a very significant A1C lowering. It targets fasting glucose, which is very good. So you're going to have a significant reduction. But it has a lot of GI side effects. I can tell you the number of patients I have in my clinic right now, and we've taken them off metformin. We have them on basically other combination therapy, and I'll get into that in a second. But once we remove metformin, they are in heaven. They didn't realize how bad metformin made them feel because of that GI distress. So they're very pleased with not having to take this medication anymore. So you know, indirectly, it does help with insulin resistance, but it's an indirect effect. So again, a good drug, but in the very near future, it will not be our only choice for first-line therapy. So the next question is, what comes after metformin? And this is where, again, I said the algorithm, we're breaking it down into two categories to begin with. Does the patient have established ASDVD? Or do they have heart failure or kidney disease? And if the answer to that is yes, then we have choices. So looking at ASCVD, the choice is a GLP-1 agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they have heart failure or chronic kidney disease, we're looking at an SGLT2 inhibitor. So again, we're looking beyond just glycemia. And do you realize that most people with diabetes, or I should say all people with diabetes, have a two-time risk, twice as likely to have heart failure than someone without diabetes? The other thing, too, is people with diabetes, one in three people will develop chronic kidney disease. One in five people with hypertension will develop chronic kidney disease. So these are things we have to look at when we're talking about our people with diabetes. Now, the current algorithm actually kind of give us, gives us a guidance over which drugs should be used based on the cardiovascular outcome trials and the evidence-based medicine. So if we look at ASCVD, it literally ranks the preferred GLP-1s 
and the preferred SGLT2s that have cardiovascular data. Now keep in mind, like here if we're looking at GLP-1s, the LEADER trial with liraglutide is very, it's proven that there's ASDVD benefit, there's a reduction in risk of cardiovascular MACE outcomes. We'll talk about that in a second. But the big thing here is to note that it is an FDA approved indication. So right now, that's the only GLP-1 that has an FDA approved indication, again, at this minute in time. Semaglutide, dulaglutide, they are hoping to get that recognition and with the rewind data, which was not available until June of this year, we're starting to see more and more commonality with some of the GLP-1s. And we'll, we'll tease that apart as we continue on. Looking at the SGLT2s, we have data on empagliflozin, we have data on canagliflozin, and now we have dapagliflozin. So three out of the four SGLT2s we have data on in terms of heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And the other interesting thing is as far as insulin, it shows that um, Glargine E100 as well as Degladec, we do not have basically any risk of cardiovascular. There might not be a benefit, but there's no worry. It's safe to use. We don't have to worry about a cardiovascular problem. But again, we have to think beyond that glycemia. Now, the algorithm also says if you're looking at weight loss, GLP-1 or an SGLT-2. So hopefully you're getting a theme here going. GLP-1, SGLT-2. These agents are being used pretty well across the board because again, we want to set our patient up for success. We don't want them gaining weight. It's preferred to lose weight or at least maintain weight. And then when we look at weight loss, Semaglutide has the most weight loss available, followed by liraglutide, dulaglutide, et cetera. So you can kind of see from the data where we have weight loss, where we have cardiovascular safety data. And then minimizing hypoglycemia, in addition to the SGLT2s and the GLP1s, this is where um, DPP4s and TZDs are actually currently listed. So, with that, I've thrown a lot of information at you on the guidelines, recognizing that the guidelines are about to change. Before we get into the deep dive of the cardiovascular outcome and renal trials, what I want to do is I want to pause for a digestion break. I want to make sure your postprandial glucose spike doesn't put you to sleep. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do, and the, phone, uh, the people that are on the phone or on the simulcast, please do this at home or at your work, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up and take a stretch and tell your neighbor something interesting you learned in this first part of our discussion. So let's everybody take a stretch, get your glucose circulating, reduce your cardiovascular risk. Once you're done sharing, go ahead, have a seat. Okay. So let me regroup everyone and let me explain the method to my madness. Why did I just do what I did? Have you stand up? Because oftentimes we come to these meetings, we hear great information, we're engaged, but our brain doesn't have time to process it. And so by taking a pause and digesting, no pun intended, the information received and repeating it out loud to someone, there is a greater chance that you will remember it not only 15 minutes from now, but maybe a week from now. So this little activity is to get this into your long-term memory and help you actually remember what we were talking about that. 
Now, before I move on, what I'd like to do, and this is just so I'm making sure we're on the same page, that what I'm saying and what you're hearing are the same, I'm actually going to come down and I'm going to ask for two people, um, so just someone from this side of the room, shout out at me something you took away or that you heard your neighbor take away. So you can you could gossip about the person you, who's talking to you. So just somebody, sh you know, shout something out at me. So the new guidelines where metformin is no longer going to be our only choice. And I'll expand on that. The new guidelines are looking at similar to the hypertension guidelines where you can pick from different agents based on the patient's needs. So that's what's coming. Okay. And this is, see, this is how I'm getting my exercise in. So somebody over here, shout out at me. Got nothing, took nothing away. No. One, yeah. So for us, the fasting and microvascular and the fluctuation. Okay, so the Fasting blood sugar is linked to microvascular, where the postprandial is linked to macrovascular, and the fluctuations do damage. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for indulging. It helps to keep us on the same page. And again, long-term memory. That's what this is all about. All right, so moving on, because I know the folks that are watching at home are probably like, where'd she go? They're probably happy I ran away. Uh, so let's look beyond glycemic control. We have to not only look cardiovascular, renal, weight, and again, hypoglycemia. So all of this is what we need to do to help our people with diabetes. Because if we could control all of this, they could lead good, long, healthy lives. I've already talked about the fluctuations in glucose. We've talked about hypoglycemia being a cardiovascular risk factor. But again, these are all the problems that are linked. And this can be in any person, regardless of A1C. Now, why do I say that? And this is where I am going to introduce the concept of time in range. And A1C is really the average of what your sugar has been over the last 30 to 90 days. So the A1C value is an average. And 50% of that value is coming from the last 30 days. It does not tell you how many times you were high or how many times you were low. It's an average. When we do a finger stick, it's a point in time. So if I checked your sugar right now and say you were 150, are you going up or are you going down? We don't know. And so this is where continuous glucose monitoring, kind of going slightly off on a tangent, but you're going to hear about continuous glucose monitoring, is going to become more of a norm in practice. And we're looking at time and range because, again, the closer you can get to keeping your sugar within a range, you're going to reduce a lot of the cardiovascular problems not to mention the glycemic problems that are affiliated with diabetes. So you're going to hear a lot about that. In addition, and this is like this is not front page news, people with kidney disease will have cardiovascular complications as well. People die from cardiovascular disease because of their kidney function. So again, cardiovascular, renal, it is linked. We're starting to see more and more people with kidney disease, as well as heart failure, all of this is linked together and making diabetes worse. So very briefly, you know, if, uh, as a reminder, back in 2008, after the rosy glitazone fiasco, um, you know, the FDA said, okay, any drugs coming out have to show that they are safe cardiovascularly to use in people with diabetes. Because again, no such thing as a person with just diabetes. So they set some guidelines for any of the clinical trials and the drug companies to put forward their drug. So if a drug came out, you know, it could get approved, but they had approved safety data. And so when we look at this, the requirements, of course, were the primary outcomes we're looking at MACE. But then there were parameters in terms of non-inferiority, whether it was a drug that was already out or the trials before the drug was actually approved. But they wanted this in different populations. And as we start to look, the populations are not only advanced disease, but elderly people as well. 
and then looking at renal function. So we have to start looking at, again, more things going on, because there is no such thing as a person with just diabetes, and minimum length of two years. So those are the guidelines. I believe we're all familiar with the MACE outcomes. You know, we don't want anybody dying. We don't want heart attacks. We don't want strokes. But several of the trials are starting to look beyond the MACE 3. They're starting to look at heart failure, renal disease, Re, um, readmission or hospitalization due to heart failure or hospitalization for unstable angina. So you'll start to see more and more. You know, the early trials were kind of following those, those MACE guidelines, but as the new trials expand and we're finding on sub-analysis of these trials, there's more to it. And so that's where we're starting to see the expansion. So, of the drugs that have come out in the late 2000s, uh, you know, in two, after 2008, we're starting to look at the GLP-1s, the SGLT-2s, and the DPP-4s. So for your sleeping pleasure, here is the list of all of the trials. You are welcome to go research them. I gave you the names of everything if you want to get more information. But bottom line, to sum it up quickly, when we look at the GLP-1s, we have mostly positive data, and I'm going to tease that out in a second. In terms of kidney disease, we don't have data at this minute in time. That will be changing. SGLT-2s, we have positive data, cardiovascular, and we're starting to see now renal data coming out. The DPP-4s have proven to be neutral in terms of cardiovascular, but there's no renal data with them at this time. So again, if you look at it, you can see the GLP-1s, SGLT-2s are really heavily favored. Now, I'm going to start with the DPP-4s because they're the easiest. And when I say that, um, I mean because really they're, they're a good drug, but do they have substance? And they fix four of the eight broken organs, which is good. They're weight neutral, so they're not gaining weight, but you're not really losing weight either. They're a low hypoglycemic risk, so again, a nice benefit. But if we think about it, their A1C lowering is minimal because they target postprandial. Drugs that target postprandial don't need heroic A1C lowering. So we get 0.4 or 0.5. Is that really helpful? Well, it can be helpful for people especially closer to normal A1Cs, but from a cardiovascular standpoint, they're neutral. They don't have a benefit. They're neutral. They don't make it worse, but they don't make it better. So is this something really that can help our patients moving forward? You know, the nice part about them is side effect. They really don't have a big side effect profile. You know, a little runny nose, a headache, nothing significant. But again, they don't have that heroic A1C lowering, um, and they don't have a big oomph in helping out a lot, of the, uh, a lot of our patients. In terms of findings from the cardiovascular data, they're neutral. But we need to be cautious in terms of heart failure because then there is some data that looks to say, well, maybe they cause heart failure. And this kind of does make sense because we're looking at the inflammation factor. Different story for different time. If time permits, I'll come back to that. But again, what's the reason with the heart failure? Was it the trial design? Is it the drug? There's a lot of question around it. So looking at this again, there's not a lot of evidence to support benefit of cardiovascular or renal. So let's get into the two drug classes that really do show cardiovascular benefit and either heart failure and or renal. So starting with the GLP-1s. GLP-1s, I love GLP-1s. They are my favorite in terms of diabetes, especially if I'm talking just diabetes from that factor. They fix six out of eight broken organs. There is no other class that fixes this many broken organs, other than insulin, which fixes five. So insulin gets close, but GLP-1s fix six out of eight broken organs. They have a cardiovascular benefit. Most of them do. Not all, but most. Weight loss. I mean, it, they, they help people lose weight. They make people feel full. Many of my patients that are on GLP-1s, once they start it, 
they're like, wow, I forgot what it was like to feel full. Because many people with type 2, they're always hungry because of the GI tract. The GI tract is super fast. It has no time to absorb, and it doesn't send the signal to the brain to say I'm full. GLP-1 slow the gastric tract down, allowing the body to actually feel like it's getting food. So people that are on this love it. They feel great. They do well. They lose weight. Very low hypoglycemic risk. Now, with that being said, I will tell you, different than the SGLT2s, there are differences in GLP-1s. So we have, just like we have basal and bolus insulin, you know, mealtime and, you know, non-mealtime insulin, basal insulin, mealtime insulin, we have short-acting and long-acting GLP-1s. So we have, in essence, a basal and a bolus GLP-1. The short-acting GLP-1s, which is exenatide twice daily and lixicenatide, they target postprandial, they're short-acting, and they basically cover the meal. Your long-acting GLP-1s, liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, they are long-acting. I know liraglutide is once daily where sema and dula are once weekly. And these basically cover fasting as well as postprandial. Now, why is that important and why is there a difference? A drug that targets fasting has a higher A1C lowering effect than a drug that targets postprandial. So you actually get a better A1C lowering with your long-acting GLP-1s. And if anyone is really looking at the chart, they're probably noticing this homogenicity line. And that's very important because I do think that that's going to be something that will differentiate these drugs down the road. So homogenicity. GLP-1, for those of you who maybe forgot or don't remember, it's a natural hormone in your gut. By this time, your endogenous GLP-1 should have kicked in to help you digest the food, tell the brain you're full, and basically, again, control not only your insulin, but your, your amylin and your glucagon within your body. You know? So hopefully your endogenous kicked in. In the drug factor of GLP-1, exogenous GLP-1, we want to know, is it a mimetic or an analog? And that's the homogenicity. Mimetics are drugs that are similar to, our horm our, to the hormone in our body, but not exactly alike. And if you go back to pharmacy school days, you remember it takes 80% or higher homogenicity to be an analog. So drugs that have a higher homogenicity to our natural GLP-1, they are more like ours. What does that mean to you? If you notice, couple things, you have a greater chance of developing antibodies to a mimetic than you do to an analog. But the other interesting factor, and I'm not sure on the coincidence of this, but I think we'll find out in the future, all of the analogs have cardiovascular safety benefits. It's just something interesting. So, you know, moving forward, is that analog feature going to be what's helping cardiovascular and potentially renal-wise. So something to think about as we look and tease apart the, the GLP-1s. Now, those were the injectable. We now have an oral GLP-1, semaglutide oral. So let me just share with you about this because obviously GLP-1s, again, I am a big fan. They fix six out of the eight broken organs. So you know, all, everybody was like looking forward to oral GLP-1, and I don't want to kind of rain on the parade here, but you have to really think about the person with diabetes. This is a great product, but it's not for everyone. So yes, it's an oral GLP-1. However, because it's a peptide and it has the snack that has to dissolve in a higher pH in the GI tract, you have to take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach with four ounces or less of water. If you drink more water or anything else, it's gonna affect the absorption and the bioavailability of the drug. So again, bottom line, you have to slowly titrate up. Of course, because it's oral, GI, first pass effect, more nausea and vomiting, but much more weight loss. 
So again, some benefits, but once daily, first thing in the morning, empty stomach, little sip of water, no food for 30 to 60 minutes after that, and then you titrate up. So is that good for everyone? Not necessarily. I have some people that would prefer a once weekly injection to a once daily pill that requires them to get up early. But I have some people that are so fearful of an injection, they're willing to do the, the oral tablet. So you really have to know your patient and have what we call shared decision making. What is the patient's willingness to do an oral tablet versus an injection? And you know, if you think about it, as far as an injection, dual glutide, the needle is hidden. So it's an added benefit there. They don't see the needle coming if they have a needle phobia. You know, we see benefit with the once weekly injections and adherence, but we see benefit with once daily injections or an oral tablet. So just things to think about with that as you move forward. So big thing with GLP-1s, as we know, we talked already, weight loss. But again, nausea and vomiting, you're slowing your GI tract. And so if you're slowing your GI tract and you're still eating at you know, Buca di Peppo or the Olive Garden or Cracker Barrel, um, you're gonna have nausea and vomiting that comes with this. So educating people is very important. And educating them how to do the injectable device is also very important with that. Now I will say it is used in prediabetes and it helps with insulin resistance. So again, something to think about in terms of GLP-1s. But now let's tease apart the cardiovascular trials. The next few slides are gonna just share the trials with you and all of the details of the primary versus secondary outcomes. So what I wanna tell you, the big take home message here, in terms of the five injectables that we're reviewing, and these are the five injectables, so I'm gonna kinda of go back and forth. So looking at the analogs, liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide. These are the long-acting analogs. If you noticed here, again, they all meet the cardiovascular safety and they have a benefit. The leader trial and the rewind trial, so that's liraglutide and dulaglutide, actually had huge numbers, very close to the high, 9,000, close to 10,000 patients. They also looked, um, dulaglutide looked at people with and without cardiovascular issues. So again, they really looked at the cardiovascular issue. Where sustained, very good trial, had less people looked at the safety issues. So there are subtle differences in the trial, but bottom line, they showed benefit. With that being said, big take home message, at least for this minute in time, the FDA has only recognized liraglutide as approved for cardiovascular safety. Um, semaglutide and dulaglutide are hoping to get that indica indication. I would be surprised if they don't, but at this minute in time, they don't have that. However, I ex expect it to be coming soon. The mimetics, on the other hand, showed no worsening of cardiovascular, but really not a big benefit. So they were more neutral they didn't have the robust data that the analog uh, GLP-1s had. And in terms of semaglutide oral, it does have data. It is not FDA approved for cardiovascular. That is something that is being looked at. Again, so down the road, maybe, but at this minute in time, no. So we have to look at this when we're moving forward. The overall findings, most GLP-1s, but not all, have a benefit. The other interesting thing is we're now starting to see could there be renal benefit? The rewind trial with dulaglutide, and I know they're also looking at uh, liraglutide and semaglutide. Is there a renal benefit? Um, I'll be honest, I'm still wrapping my head around this because these drugs don't work on the kidney, so how is this mechanistically possible? There are receptors on the kidney, but what is actually happening? We don't know. And the renal data right now is a sub-analysis of the cardiovascular outcome. So keep in mind, everything I just talked about was cardiovascular trials, but now we're starting to see sub-analysis renally. Now, moving forward into the last group are the SGLT2s. But before I jump into that, 
not going to ask you to stand up, but I do want you to pause. We're going to pause for 17 seconds, only 17 seconds, and I want you briefly to either write down or tell the neighbor next to you something interesting that we talked about in terms of the GLP ones. So 17 seconds, tell your neighbor something. Okay, I'm going to regroup everyone. So again, that was a nice little quick digestion break to kind of, again, reinforce anything we talked about in terms of GLP-1. The, the rest of the time now, I'm going to jump into SGLT-2 before we wrap it up and go into Q&A. So SGLT-2 inhibitors, for those of you who may or may not know much about this class, these work on the kidney. If you think about it, our renal threshold, going back to pharmacy school again, when do we start peeing out sugar? When does the, how high does the, the blood, the sugar in the blood have to get before the kidneys no longer reabsorb and release it into the urine? And if everybody remembers, that's 180. Now, interesting, as your blood glucose goes up or as we get older, that level might go up as well. It's actually estimated, Dr. DeFranzo did some research, and people with an A1C of 6.5, their renal threshold might be as high as 205, because the body is trying to reabsorb that sugar. The higher the sugar gets, the body doesn't want to lose it. So it's trying to reabsorb because it's not in the cell and the body thinks it's starving. So it's trying to reabsorb, and this causes the glucose levels, I'm sorry, the renal threshold to go up. So SGLT2s lower the renal threshold. So instead of peeing out sugar at 180, you're now peeing out sugar at 150. So it's lowering your blood sugar, or you know, your renal threshold. Now, <clears throat> if we think about that, in a way, take home message, it's like a glucose diuretic. I mean, really it is because you're peeing out sugar, and sugar never travels by itself. It always brings water with it. So you're losing calories. You're actually losing about three or 400 calories uh, by peeing out sugar, that much sugar in a day. But you're also losing water, which of course means you know, electrolytes. So those are, again, things that should, you should be thinking about. Now, we know, you know ASCVD benefit, heart failure benefit, again, a glucose diuretic, weight loss, low hypo risk. Also, there's SGLT1 receptors in the gut, as well as SGLT2 receptors in the gut. So what is the relationship to the GI tract? And we're still learning that. That's a different lecture for a different time. But when we look at the SGLT2s, I'll be honest, they're pretty, pretty similar. They don't have that basal bolus like the GLP-1s. There's a lot of similarities across the board with this. However, right now we only have data from three um, clinical or cardiovascular trials from three of the agents. The fourth one is coming down the road. But let's look at SGLT2s. I want people to realize this moving forward, especially folks that work in the hospital, because if you've got a patient coming in on one of these drugs and you do a urinalysis and you see sugar in the urine, you might go, oh my God, you know, this, pro this is a problem. But it's not. That's normal. They should be paying out sugar. So it is something that we have to look for, you know, we have to look at with our patients. But again, if you're paying out more sugar, remember sugar and bacteria are BFFs. They love hanging out together. So again, you have a lot of people that will, of course, develop urinary tract infections. I will t I'll be honest, we use a lot of these at our clinic um, because they're a nice combo. We do a combo with uh, SGLT2s and metformin or SGLT2 DPP4 combo. We have a lot of success. Our patients actually feel better. However, we spend an awful lot of time about making sure people know how to clean down there if you get what I mean. Because again, 
urinary tract infections, genital urinary infections are very common. So we spend a lot of time on hygiene, rehydrating, because you can dehydrate from this. For any of you headed to the bar tonight, if you drink a little extra alcohol and you're on one of these things, you may dehydrate. You can predict that. So hydration is very, very important with these agents. Again, it's like a glucose diuretic. So we have to think about that moving forward. Now, I've already talked about the precautions. We've got to watch out for those infections. Some of them can be very bad. You know, you can, you've probably heard of the foreigners uh, gangrene. You know, we have patients freaking out in the terms of uh, Dr. Eden Miller, who's an endocrinologist in Portland. She always tells her patients, don't worry, the undercarriage is okay. It's not going to fall out. But bottom line, people get very nervous. So we have to be prepared. The other thing is we can actually get diabetic ketoacidosis at normal glucose levels with this. So we have to be able to watch for that as well. So these are things that we have to think about with these agents. But now let's talk the good. I mean, cardiovascular and renal. Majority of the clinical trials on the SGLT2s have been cardiovascular based, but we found a sub-analysis of some renal benefits in many, to the point that many of the companies are now saying, hey, these might be a good drug for kidney disease, and let's take a look at that. And so now you're starting to see more renal trials being developed and utilized with the SGLT2s. And again, here's just the landscape of what is and what's coming in terms not only of cardiovascular, but renal outcomes. So let's look at the cardiovascular outcomes first. So for the big three right now, um, Canvas, uh, Declare Timmy, and Empareg, which are respectively for canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin, we know that there is a cardiovascular benefit. Empagliflozin was the leader in this. They came out, they found the cardiovascular benefit, and they actually got the FDA approval that they are safe for use and actually have a benefit for people with ASCVD as well as kidney disease and heart failure. However, at that time, they didn't do the renal stuff. That's coming down the pipeline because now they're finding out the benefit of what happened. They also looked at secondary prevention, whereas Declare Timmy and Canvas looked at primary and secondary prevention. So again, cardiovascular, we know the benefit is there. I expect the guidelines to really address this. Bottom line, these are supposed to be first-line therapy any day now. So that's your choice with the new guidelines from what I'm hearing is going to be your choice will be either metformin or an SGLT2. Now hopefully people will start adapting and utilizing these drugs and looking again beyond glycemic measures, looking at that cardiovascular benefit. Now the next few slides are a lot of the meta-analysis and data collection that supports the cardiovascular outcomes. So looking here at Canvas and Empareg, whether it's renal or cardiovascular, you can see it favors the SGLT2 inhibitor. When we look at, again, ASCVD, it favors the SG SGLT2. So again, this is looking at just the ASCVD in SGLT2s, favorable to SGLT2s. But now what about hospitalization due to heart failure? And if you look here, what's very interesting, it was looking at people that their EGFR was less than 60. So hence coming the renal data and the renal benefits. And then when we start to look at the composite um, of worsening renal function and end-stage renal disease, again, with people of a, a EGFR less than 60. So we're now starting to look at moderate and even moving forward to severe kidney disease in terms of SGLT2s. Now, the one and only trial to date that is published and has data is Credence. And this is a trial that looked at renal with cardio as secondary. So renal is your primary outcome, cardiovascular secondary. And they looked at people with an EGFR between 30 and 90. So again, from severe to 
um, not as severe kidney disease. So this truly looked at kidney disease. And with that being said, the other SGLT2s are looking at at, as well, because we're starting to see that SGLT2s, not only cardiovascular safety, heart failure, and potentially even kidney. So looking at just the credence data, you can see here, again, these are people with established kidney disease favoring the SGLT2. Again, also cardiovascular disease. The other thing is um, how many people had worsening of serum creatinine and then even albuminuria. So looking at the albuminuria to creatinine ratio, and then blood pressure. So again, a lot of data, because if you think about it, if we lower the blood pressure, especially in the RAS system, it makes a benefit. It, stress, it takes the stress out of the kidneys, also saving the heart failure. Now there was talk about canonical flows in, I know, causing amputation, and the question is, is it just canonical flows in, or is it all of the SGLT2s? And to be honest, I don't have that answer, because from the credence data, it showed really it was about the same as placebo, and my question to you is, does diabetes cause lower extremity amputation? The answer, of course, yes. So is it the drug, or is it the disease? And we don't have that clear data yet to support that. So how do the SGLT2s protect the kidneys? There's a lot of theories going on about this, um, and here they all are. But bottom line, realize that the kidneys also have gluconeogenesis going on. So by reducing gluconeogenesis in the kidneys, by reducing the stress level on the RAS system, by lowering the blood pressure, by lowering the oxidative stress, we're all saving not only the kidney, but the heart. So the findings from the SGLT2, basically cardiovascular benefit, heart failure benefit, and potentially chronic kidney disease benefit. However, what we do have to do is make sure we educate our patients appropriately because the side effect profile, especially that genital urinary infection, dehydration, risk of DKA comes along with this. So again, there's always a little poison in every medicine, but the more education we do for our patients, the less problems that they'll have. And as a colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, George Bakris, who is a nephrologist, but he likes to say he's a nephrologist that specializes in diabetes, his point is SGLT2 inhibitors are cardio renal reducing agents that have a glucose lowering effect as their side effect. So you're starting to see more nephrologists and cardiologists prescribe and look at SGLT2s and more cardiologists in the GLP-1 arena as well. So your take home message to you is basically we have to look beyond glycemic measures. So what I'd like to do is I wanna do a wrap up digestion so what I'd like for everyone to do before we jump into the Q&A, once again, I'm going to ask you to stand up and share two things, two things, not three, but two, with your neighbor that you took away from today's presentation. So stand up and stretch, but don't hit anyone. the pickup head, you know, head. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm always clean up, I'm always clean up. That's it. What I'm gonna do is see if I can get two things from them that they took away, and then that'll, and then that's, that's good, and then I'll, I'll take, yeah, I'll pass up. Okay. And if you're done, I'll have everybody take a seat. Folks watching at home, feel free to send your pearls that you've learned to, uh, on the email. That would be great, because we want to know what concepts people took away. So what I want to do before I turn it back over to Dr. Fugit um, is basically, again, 
What's, what resonated with you? So if I can get somebody in this area to shout something out at me, what is something that you were like, wow, I didn't know that, or that really resonated with me? Nothing, I put everybody to sleep. Yeah. What's something that resonated? Got nothing? I guess I gotta come down. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah? What do you got? Two people, just want two people. One person here and then I'm gonna go there. Somebody have? What's something over here? Something that resonated or you heard your neighbor say? Okay. Excellent, excellent. Because, you know, so the, the comment was that the side effects of the SGLT2s are not as scary as they're made out to be. And maybe the benefits outweigh the, the risks in this particular case. And seriously, I want to add to that the reason why the side effects are so scary is because we don't spend time educating. If we just educate, people will be just fine. Knowledge is power. If they get it, they'll do fine. All right, somebody else over here. I feel like I've neglected people in the back. Okay. Okay, so actually that's more of a question, and if you don't mind, I'm going to save your question for a little bit later. But it, the question, just so folks know, was about gastric paresis and slowing down the GI tract, which is excellent. So I want to get one more pearl of a takeaway that somebody took away. One more. Somebody shout something. Yeah. All the information in all these these cases, what targets are right Yeah. The inflammation, the role of inflammation in all of these disease states. Excellent. And you know what? Diabetes is an inflammatory disease, and so is cardiovascular. So yes, that is a huge role. So with that, what I want to do is basically pass this over to uh, Dr. Fugit. Finish with your no. questions. Eh, we're good. We'll do question Q and A. No, no, you're. Uh, oh my! Uh, the, we we talked points. about all that. You're Bottom, ready to go. Excellent. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. <laughs> they can read that. Fall asleep later. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, one thing that you can always tell from a professional speaker is they will always finish right on time. <laughs> and it's so wonderful to work with such a professional. Exceptional talk, Dr. Cornell. All right, let's go back to our questions. So here's where we get to see how you did and get a little bit of an idea of what you've learned today. So we'll start off with our first question and we're actually gonna compare how you did before and obviously after. So Mrs. S, again, is a 65-year-old lady with type 2 diabetes. She's been taking her metformin for two years. Her A1C is currently 7.9, her EGFR is 90. She was recently diagnosed with heart failure. Which therapy would you be best recommending as an addition to her regimen. Would you add albiglutide, empagliflozin, saxagliptin, or citagliptin? Go ahead and vote. Okay, look at that. And pretty smart to begin with. Yeah. And that's the is the correct one. Is your mark working? Could you, uh, there we go. Empagliflozin is correct, obviously, SGLT2, the glucose diuretic, lowering the cardiac output, the volume, et cetera. Good. Wonderful. All Great right. group. All right, our second question. For which GLP-1 receptor agonist is there the strongest evidence for cardiovascular disease benefit in patients with type 2 diabetes and established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Lixisendidide, long-acting exenatide, semaglutide, or liraglutide? Please vote. Please don't roll off the tongue as well as you do it. <laughs> it's because I'm older. All right, liraglutide, exactly. And again, that's the one that has the FDA approval. What is so amazing is yeah. the initial uh, answers were almost always correct. That's wonderful. But we still have significant improvement. Yeah. 
All right. The long one for patients without established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or CKD whose hemoglobin A1C levels are above target following first line therapy and for whom there is a compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, the American Diabetes Association Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes has suggested one option for the treatment is a GLP-1 receptor agonist with good efficacy for weight loss. What is the correct order of these medications in terms of efficacy? And again, I'll let you uh, read that. Dr. Cornell. Yes, and semaglutide does have the most weight loss. So absolutely. So the answer is semaglutide, because remember, these are the people without established ASCVD, so we don't have to worry about that FDA approval for, for that condition. Um, but semaglutide is the one that has the most established weight loss. Which clinical trial's primary outcome was renal with cardiovascular secondary? Leader, Credence, Saber Timmy, Pioneer 6. All right, Credence, great. So we wow. saw a big increase in that. And obviously, again, Credence was the renal trial, where the other ones were cardiovascular with renal subanalysis afterwards. But knowing moving forward, we're going to see a lot more uh, renal trials with the SGLT2s. So yay, good and job. Amazing. Awesome. All right. Well, considering those answers, I'm pretty confident as to where this is going to go. Please rate your confidence now in optimally treating patients with type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular comorbidities. Again, very confident, confident, somewhat confident, and I could probably leave off the last two, but slightly confident or not at all. Look at okay. that. We're improving. We're getting there. Absolutely. No. Move the bar significantly. Now, reach your familiarity with cardiovascular outcome trials for medications for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Again, very familiar, familiar, somewhat familiar, slightly familiar, or not familiar. Question and guess. Okay. okay. Look at that, Dr. Right. Cornell. Yeah, cardiovascular. You, you, you've left none of them being yeah. not at all familiar. I was going to say, I know the cardiovascular, uh, the names of the trials can get confusing and all of that. So I know how that's confusing, but I'm glad people at least are more familiar with it now. Over 50% are familiar. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's great. Okay. Right. Well, we're going to start our question and answer session now. This is my favorite part of these programs. Mm -hmm. We have two microphones uh, each side of the rooms, right next to the projectors. We also have our online folks that uh, will be sending me their questions up here, and I'll be uh, going through each one of them. Now, I believe you've had a question we first. We do have a question first, so, like so I, I do want to address the that question first. first, and that will give you a chance to maybe look at the online ones coming in, and if other folks want to come up to the microphone. So I'm going to take, the question was about gastroparesis. And how does that affect you know, using the GLP-1s if the GLP-1s are slowing the GI tract, which is an excellent question. So I want to differentiate. The gastroparesis, for the most part, of course, the damage of the nerves in the GI tract comes from long-standing hyperglycemia. It is definitely more seen in type 1, but you can see it in type 2. In those cases, you cannot use a GLP-1. Most people with type 2 diabetes actually have a very fast GI tract. So Dr. Ralph DeFranzo, he radio tagged food, and he found that people without diabetes, it takes about 90 minutes for food to get from your mouth through the small intestine. But in people with type 2 diabetes, food from the mouth to the small intestine is 30 minutes. And so that's the speed of the GI tract which causes the postprandial spike and doesn't tell the brain that it's full. So in newly diagnosed or people that have long-standing type 2 without gastroparesis, they would be good. In someone with gastroparesis being a type 1 
or a long-standing uncontrolled type 2 with um, gastric nerve damage, you could not use that. So, yeah, excellent question. Good point. We have yes. a question over here. Yes, oh. uh, <laughs> thank you very much for this great presentation. Uh, now, we hear a lot about a lot of diets as coming, uh, sp specifically I'm talking about keto and all of this uh, diets that are coming in the practices. Would that make a difference on your selection of these uh, SGL2 and uh, uh, GLP uh, products? How would you comment okay. on that? So just so I'm understanding correctly, th there's a lot of talk about the diets like the keto diet, the Atkins, mm -hmm. intermittent fasting diets, and would that make a difference? Um, so let me address the diet first, and then I'm going to come back to the drug. So in general, when we talk about diet, if you think about diet, there's a start and a finish. Anytime you start and finish, that's not a lifestyle change. So diets are great for short-term weight loss. Um, you've got to fit into that dress for, for your wedding or for your daughter's wedding or something like that. But you, you know, it's not a long-term effect. Diets are not good. We want healthy lifestyle changes. So when people come to me and say, well, what about this diet? Will it help? For short term, yes. Long term, no. The question is, can you do this diet for the rest of your life? And if the answer is yes, I can do this for the rest of my life, well then okay. But it has to be a long term lifestyle change. So with that being said, these diets in the terms of GLP-1s and SGLT-2s and even DPP-4s really wouldn't affect my thought process. Where it would, sulfonylureas. So I'm very happy to say that from what I'm hearing with the new guidelines, sulfonylureas will finally be in the garbage can because that's the only place they really should be. Um, other than high risk for hypoglycemia, weight gain, cardiovascular issues, why are we using them? They're cheap, I know. But um, that's, that's where I would not use a drug, or my drug decision on a sulfonylurea with the diet would be made. These newer agents, no. Oh, we have another yes. question. Mm -hmm. If you were to suggest an SGLT2 to a uh, cardiologist for a heart failure patient, what would you tell them if they came back and said, it's just an expensive diuretic? So what would I tell the, um, so a cardiologist says, um, you know, heart failure patient, it's just an expensive diuretic. They're not wrong. However, if it's a person, so let me backtrack with that. If you're talking about a heart failure patient without diabetes, that is questionable at this time because I know, um, at least not in this country, in other countries, Daploglifosin is approved with or without diabetes for heart failure, but that's not here. Um, again, they're not wrong. However, if it's a person with diabetes, it helps lower sugar, it protects the kidneys. They're probably, the concern is it improves HEF ref, but not necessarily HEF PEF. And HEF-PEF, we know, is more of the detrimental component. So in this particular case, I do think it's a good option, but there needs to be more going on. It does need to be a patient with diabetes, you know, again, protecting the kidneys. So, And diuretics have more side effects, really, than SGLT2s in a diabetes person. So you get more bang for your buck with it. Hi. Hi. For a SGLT2 inhibitor, for renal functions, do you cap it at 30 or 45? So with SGLT2 with renal functions, do I cap it at 30 or 45? I do try to follow the labels, and obviously the, the uh, PI does say for some is 30, for others less than 45. The current, whoop, did I lose there? Current guidelines are going with less than 45. I do believe there will be a, a label change on that soon. So currently, you know, I would go above 45. I wouldn't go below just to be on the safe side. However, I see a change coming down the pipeline. Okay, well, I have one question here for you, Dr. Cornell. You had mentioned uh, that glucose variability can worsen outcomes in patients undergoing, uh, 
undergoing PCI with an MI. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that patients have better glucose control prior to going to the cath lab? So should patients have better glucose control prior to going to the cath lab? In a perfect world, that would be wonderful. But as we all know, sometimes we have to weigh the benefits, the risks, and the benefits. So in a perfect world, it would be good. I mean, in ideal situations, glucose variability and fluctuation can affect any surgery or procedure. And that's the reason oftentimes we want a tighter control before sending these people to surgery or a procedure. But in some cases, we don't have that luxury. So again, it would be ideal, but it's not always optional. Absolutely. And uh, now you mentioned that uh, metformin is slowly on its way out to some degree. However, these newer agents are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Do you expect to see a significant uptake in the newer agents prior to the decrease in metformin? So, you know, what, do I see a change coming down the pipeline? Metformin is dirt cheap. It's easy, it's affordable. We use it all the time in our clinic because I can send them down the street to the pharmacy for a $4 generic, or some of our pharmacies have it free. And I know um, Dr. Fugit and I were talking, I've talked to several of my colleagues that are inpatient, because I'm outpatient, I get them after the fact. You know, a lot of the inpatients don't see these newer agents mm -hmm. being used, people coming in. And really, the uptake in the SGLT2s and GLP1s is a bit slow. It's probably more beneficial. There's more uptake in the SGLT2s because it's an oral tablet comparative to GLP1s. However, recognizing that the guidelines I had up today were 2019, the new guidelines with a choice for first line coming out are coming in a few weeks. So my question is this, how long does it take prescribers to get up to date on the guidelines? That's the big question. And how long does it take third party payers to get up to date on the guidelines? Now I do know there's a lot of interest, but can we roll this out across the country and across into rural areas where cost is an issue? Absolutely. So sometimes we have to do the wrong thing the right way. Yeah. And we have to use these cheaper drugs, but we need to use them safely and effectively. So I would love to see these newer drugs more used, but until people can afford it and get it, we're, we're in a pickle. Right, now you bring up a very good point. I mean, especially when these individuals are admitted in the hospital, I mean, the metformin's almost always stopped anyway. Right. Secondary to right. radiologic procedures and so forth, so. And in a hospital, really, they should just be on insulin. Right. You know, I'm still a right. fan of insulin only in the hospital. Agreed. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, but uh, I've got about another minute left. Does anyone else have another question before we close it down for the night? We'll get everybody to the rodeo. Uh, everybody's gone to the rodeo. <laughs> I had a gentleman <laughs> ask me. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will linger. Okay, hold on questions. one second before you guys leave. I just want to go over a few quick housekeeping tips. Obviously, the first thing is make sure that you fill out that form that is at each of your desks and uh, make sure that you give that to a NACME official before you leave. We want to make sure that you get your one and a half credits for today. And I also want to truly thank the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education for the honor of being here tonight. On behalf of Dr. Cornell and myself, and we also want to thank uh, Beringer Ingelheim, Lilly, and Novo Nordisk again for their kind contribution to this program. Please be safe out there and have a great night. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>